You ready, Zed? All right. <laughs> so I know I know Mike is uh, anxious to dive into it. I just want to start off by encouraging you guys to throw any questions you have out there, or you know, obviously we've gotten some um, comments in the chat as well. So um, we love the interactiveness. So with that, I'm going to let set Mike loose because <laughs> he's excited. Just straining, straining at the leash here, Zed. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, so I always like storytelling when you when you tell part of the end uh, first to build the anticipation and and here here it is, yeah it worked, forty five colors so super exciting and so the story we're going to tell today though is is also around how how do you get from from here to there and how do you think around forty five colors uh, how do you think around high parameter and also low parameter panel design and think about spread and think about replacing traditional floors and why would you do that so there's a lot to to pick apart. In this in this story today, and, and I'm really excited that you that you guys uh, chose to chose to join us this morning or or this late evening as as it may be. And I think I want to start by just categorizing what we're talking about when we talk about conventional dyes, because in many ways we're still leveraging conventional dyes, as you'll see in our panels, but we're also replacing those conventional dyes with, for reasons that we'll describe. And really, those reasons are conventional dyes only behave in two different ways, right? And we'll talk about how. We've, we've, we've moved beyond this type of performance, but also how we categorize that type of performance. And dyes only perform in two, these traditional dyes only perform in two different ways. One that we're all relatively familiar with, with is, which is this, the fact that dyes are, are cross-excited by multiple lasers, right? Something like PE dazzle or the PE conjugates, cross-excited by both the blue and the yellow or the green lines, right? And then we've also got this, the other characteristic where we have something like the BV510, you know, a, a traditional dye that we'll talk quite a bit about, that has this characteristic of being narrowly excited, but has broad this broad emission. And so in both cases, we'll discuss how either of these could lead to a, a large amount of school overspreading, a loss of resolution of the underlying biology. And then our intent to actually go back in there and either remove or replace floors that have this kind of characteristic. So the way that today is organized is we're gonna talk quite a bit around panel design uh, and hopefully some, some interesting new insights there in terms of how we think around iterative panel design when you have the ability to actually quite literally go in and essentially overhaul an engine, right? You can say, look, I wanna take out floors and, and put in new clean floors that have low spectral uh, spillover. Again, a concept that we'll discuss. And then actually, how do you do that iteratively and think around making this a panel uh, that can be incredibly stable and incredibly have incredible spectral hygiene, right? And so that's a concept that we'll come back to. And we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about spillover spreading really as our North Star of panel design. The second thing is, you know, when you think around the number of antibodies that we're having to, to put together in a panel, one of the questions that we've gotten repeatedly is, well, how do, you, how do you get from here to there, right? And so we'll actually spend some time discussing how we've essentially built this manufacturing capacity and the ability to print antibodies, both traditional antibodies that you'd expect for high energy density markers and traditional markers, CD4, CD3, CD19, but also some of the, some of the more special antibodies that, again, Senna will describe in her panel, and then we'll show you how we actually validate those antibodies um, how we manufacture those and what that data looks like, and then how we are actually now leveraging that capability for customers, right? So we were our own, uh, essentially, we were our own, I guess, third or fourth customers because we weren't the first customs, uh, uh, customers. And then we'll talk about the 45 color uh, data in terms of its performance, in terms of its spread, and in terms of the analysis and, and the status that, that, we've, that we've taken that to. So you can imagine it is a, a large data set that we're still wrestling to ground. And so you'll, we'll give you some, some insights on where we are with that and then also where we're, where we're looking to go with it. We're also, throughout this talk, we'll be leveraging uh, innovations that are brought to us by spectral cytometry, which in many ways reveal a lot of the issues uh, with traditional dyes. And in fact, you know, the, you know, in, in many ways, spectral is a response to having the behavior of traditional dyes have this notion of having a signature, right, where you have fluorescence that's in these secondary channels. And again, it's used to great effect for phenotyping and you can deconvolute multiple signals against something that we'll, we'll discuss a, a bit about. So you can increase the theoretical number of colors per panel. But at the same time, you know, you can see that there's no magic wand that you can wave over having spread that's contributed, spectral spread that's contributed in all the non-primary detectors, right? And so it inhibits your ability um, when you have dye performance like this to detect things in, in other detectors. And so again, we'll come back to this concept and it also raises this question that's kind of been, been bothering us for a little while and we'll ask it again in another way when we talk about spillover spreading in a second. But the question really becomes, well, what if you had better performing dots and could run it leveraging this instrument, right? And, and could you do a, quite a bit more with this instrument as a proxy also for other instruments? And so to that point, 
one of the things that we think about is not in terms of, okay, well, here's, here's dye signatures and we have the ability to deconvolute them. But in fact, what would a perfect dye be? Right? And we're using, again, the, the Aurora as an example here, but it applies for every single flow photometer. And a perfect label would only hit probably about a 10 nanometer you know, band pass. And it would only hit that. It would be narrowly excited. It would be incredibly narrowly emitting. right? And it would contribute no fluorescence anywhere else. There'd be zero spread contribution, no secondary fluorescence. And if we were to titrate down from there, in terms of the, the level of perfection, if you will, we would have a tad less than perfect blue, where we would have significant single in the blue, and then we have a little bit less signal trailing off, right, into further parts in the blue. And again, this is the bar that we'll that we'll set ourselves to, and we'll actually, you know, show you some of the spectral clarity that we have in our labels. I think the final point to make here, which I won't really beat into the ground because I think we've made this point uh, several times, is that dyes have always driven hardware development, and they're still driving hardware development. And in many ways, what we hope is that, that, that some of the some of the work we're doing to really push the limits on spectral clarity really can continue to push hardware innovation, right? Which is something that we get incredibly excited about. And the reason, for, you know, the reason we get excited about that is if you think about the development of the first PE tandems, then you get in response to the development of the 12 color fax bandage, the development of the quantum dots, then the development of the 18 color LSR2 in response, development of the brilliant dyes, development of the fax symphony in response. And really, as we saw dye development, really, if you will, trail off, at least new dye development uh, trail off, really in the, in the, in, you know, in the, in really over the past decade, in response, you get the, the, the innovations that are brought to us by spectral cytometry, right? You get this downward pressure saying, we really want to be able to answer more questions per cell. And so we end up in an environment where, you know, we want to leverage spectral to be able to pull apart more questions per cell, right? And that's really is accommodating non-ideal dye performance. And I think it's worth calling that out. And so, you know, in 2020, we've released 19 actually different labels and 17 unique colors. For what it's worth, I'm counting only truly new fluorophores here, right? Not rebranded dyes or, or copies of Alexa fluors. I'm talking about purely new dyes that have been shown to work in flow cytometry, right? And the way that we've thought about making those dyes in our first six blue, yellow, green labels was what if we could have labels that are both narrowly excited, but also narrowly emitting, right? And so we've shown this and, and shown multiple examples of how we've done this and worked with customers off of the blue and yellow green laser, really thinking around, if you will, ending sort of the tyranny of PE and PE conjugates, where we can now leverage all of the blue detectors and all of the yellow detectors off of not just a, 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 a spectral cytometer, but also a conventional cytometer. And we layered on top of that a, a set of, 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 of more unique labels now. So this is all 17 of our unique labels, just showing how they would fit in, into the, you know, fit into, a, you know, essentially a table of excitation and emission. But overall, the thing that we're going for here, and again, that will characterize is that if you can narrowly excite and narrowly emit, in other words, have this, this, this notion of being very, uh, have this notion of spectral clarity, that you can then leverage all of these together. And so the way we think about this is essentially thinking about all of the detectors, if you will, in this matrix and hitting them pixel by pixel. Right. And so we'll describe that, we'll characterize what that means in terms of spillover spread. We'll define spillover spreading as our, again, as our North Star. But I wanted to give, the, give you this concept because it's also this, if you will, matrix that informs, well, okay, well, what antigens, if we take dyes out, what, where do we move those antigens? And then how can we actually upgrade a panel and, and not just, not just you know, take it and replace what we've, what's already been done in the past, but really push, push the envelope and go into higher colors. How do we do any of this? We take small organic dyes, bind them onto oligonucleotides, and then self-assemble them into this phyton structure. And it's this phyton structure that actually enables us the precise engineering and design of truly new labels. And the reason we can do that is because we can actually take components, take dyes also that have been not used in full cytometry, right? And actually put them onto the platform and control their geometry. So in other words, if you think about fluorescence resonance energy transfer, it actually scales to the square of distance. So we can actually tune the geometry of that. So what we get as a result of that is tunable excitation and emission, right? And it's also that because I have four arms, and I'll use this as an example, because I have four arms of this phyton structure, I also have the ability to tune brightness. And so it's an incredibly flexible platform, right? In terms of the engineering. The thing that's not flexible about it is actually it's a very rigid structure and it's actually because of these crossover regions here, right? And these crossover regions are non-natural and actually what, what's create, that's what creates a very rigid structure where the geometry of those floors is fixed. And you'll see, I'll show you some of our new stability data, but these, these fluorescent labels as well as our conjugated antibodies are room temperature stable as well as fixative stable, right? 
And so the other point to make here is that while we're leveraging FRET on the platform, these dyes are bound to the DNA structure very, very rigidly. They are not tandem dyes. And I'll show you the number of ways that they're not tandem dyes with respect to stability, and the fact that they don't break down in solution, right? And the fact that we get just incredible stability as well as consistency on these floors. But the other flexibility that I have through this platform is actually the ability to hang a single stranded oligo off of the edge of it and use that to conjugate it to antibodies. And that's exactly what we've done. That's what we'll be leveraging in the printing capacity to be able to handle uh, the creation of the antibodies that, that we'll describe in our panel. So we've covered the requirements of this in, in other talks. I just wanna mention this briefly, and then we'll, we'll dive into the, how we really thought around iteratively performing this panel design after I set the stage really for, for set and to, to take us through some of our iterative panel design. But the first thing, of course, the, the, the key requirement that we have is these labels have to be bright and clean. So we've discussed that notion in terms of their excitation and the mission. We'll describe the impact in panel design in a moment. Consistent and stable, I'll actually show you, I'll show you some of our updated stability data. Our labels are room temperature stable on their own for at least two weeks. They are also room temperature stable in their conjugated antibody form. Uh, for two weeks, and they're they're also fixative stable for two weeks. Not only are they stable, but they're also stable across the spectrum. So, so I'll also show you some of that data as well. We'll also mention this concept of digital fluorescence, which will really flow forward into some of our future directions, because we also have the ability to control the brightness, as I mentioned, of these labels, which is something that could, in theory, be used for actually additional multiplexing and leveraging the channels that we already have on our extant cytometer. So with that, what I'm going to do here in the panel design section is actually set the stage for setting, I'm gonna describe our North Star of spillover spreading, really define that, think about how we, we objectively think through spillover spreading, use that as the bar for our panel design efforts as well as our floor four and floor four development efforts. Um, and then let her describe some of this iterative process uh, that, that we've gone through. So the first thing that I think I, I kind of wanted to zoom back out again and just say, okay, like what is the goal of panel design, right? And it's, you know, I, I've adapted this slide from, from Florian Mayer, uh, who's at the Hutch now, but really it's high resolution of populations and markers of interest with as many markers as possible, right? And so think about the ingredients that make that up. Well, maintaining QC instrument, well, we don't make instruments, so we, we can't, can't really handle that. Although I'll show you that we've gotten, uh, you know, I think really many thanks due to, to, Seddon's, to Seddon's work and then also the consistency of, of the Aurora that we're running on, a very consistent instrument. So I'll show you that uh, towards the end of the talk. Understanding spread and how to deal with it. I mean, this is a fundamental contributor to spread. Uh, it is the primary contributor to loss of resolution, as we'll describe. And then I think another one that's that's pretty obvious, appropriate set of controls. Something else, though, that we will talk about, right, which is in, which is having this appropriate set of controls, right? Because as a flyer, right, if you have tandem dyes and you have a rare population or you have a low antigen expression dye, you know, you have to use beads, right? And there could be differences in between cells and beads. And so you end up, you know, having issues with those controls. With Nova floors, once you bind this onto an antibody, it doesn't matter. The fluorescence doesn't change, right? So you can use CD4 or CD8 or any antibody to compensate those. So I think we'll also describe how you can use an appropriate set of controls. But again, we're gonna ask this question, what if instead of just dealing with spread, we engineered and designed for that at two different levels, both the fluorescence infrastructure level, let's actually make fluorophores that, are, that, that have less spread overall, but then also leverage that in the panel. Again, something that said and we'll describe. I also want to characterize, and I wanted to just name it because I think we always talk about spillover and we got to deal with it. And, you know, it's kind of like, and it reminds me of sort of, you know, not actually facing up to the, not facing up to your problems. So I think, you know, the first step in, the first step in recovery is admitting you have a problem. Spillover is the enemy. Let's name it, right? And so, and in fact, that's, this is a, this is a critical item and it'll affect all the panel design view that we have. And three factors are critical for separating cells. We're going to ignore Q for a second because we don't design hardware. We just make it better. Right? We just allow you to leverage all of its capabilities. But if you have this, this range of detection, for instance, right, that is 10 logs, or sorry, five logs here, you have three main sources of background. Electronic noise, that's just coming from just quite literally the electronics that are on the instrument. Autofluorescence, which I think most of us are very familiar with in terms of, of the, uh, the cell types, and then that is what will be cell type specific. And then spread, and spread is without a doubt the largest contributor to you know, this loss of resolution, this loss of separation of populations. And in fact, to name that, well, this is some great, uh, a great article uh, from Laura uh, here, is, you know, if we think about the, comp the reality of post-compensation, this photon counting error spillover spreading shows up into our data. And really, I think we should also name it, causes, the, causes false positives in our data, right? In an ideal world, we would actually have not just the medians of these lined up, which is the definition of compensation, we'd also have incredibly resolved populations, right? And remember what this would enable. 
This would enable greater use of machine learning tools, greater use of clustering, easier data analysis really by everyone, right? Um, as, as well as easier uh, panel design. And in fact, we've also shown previously that in fact, we have approached this near ideal situation. Again, we were looking at this subjectively, we'll show you objectively how we, how we characterize these for both labels and panels in a moment. But this is the thing that gets me excited. This, you know, this, this simple plot where we've taken single stain controls. Again, this is off in a tune. This is not off in Aurora or any other type of uh, uh, high-end instrument. And this is off of adjacent detectors that are detecting off of the 530 and the 610. And you can see the post-compensation, we just aren't seeing spillover spreading. And so this is what gets us excited when we think around, okay, what could you leverage in the context of a larger panel? If you had, for instance, say eight or 10 or even more floor fours that had this type of spread performance. This is the subjective view of the universe. The objective view of the universe, and this is something that we will come back to quite a few times, is how do you think around characterizing labels across all of the way that they may interact with other fluorescent labels? And so you can generate a spillover spreading matrix, right? Um, and, and you can handle that error, that photon counting error in a smart way. One thing that we will continue to come back to is actually this notion of a row sum where you have floor fours, if you will, on the y-axis and the x-axis. And this row sum will identify floors that cause a lot of spillover, right? And we will identify these and actually generate a hit list of floors that are causing a lot of spillover in a panel. The other thing that you can do in leveraging this is take an extant panel and actually drop in new floors and use that as a characterization uh, um, infrastructure to say, well, what if, if I add a new floor in, how does it impact my ability to resolve other, uh, uh, you know, resolve markers that are on other floors? And that's something that we've done with our previous work that I'll show you and it's work that's in progress now for this 45 color work to characterize a much broader set of labels. And so in some work that we've shown previously, we've shown, you know, we dropped uh, six of our, our first blue and yellow green labels into this 34 color uh, backbone that was adapted from, from Cytex 35 color backbone. And it had a lot more to do with not just achieving a number of, of colors, but it had to do with characterizing our labels, seeing if they could work with the brilliant stain buffers, and then quite literally asking, can these simply be plug and played and can they be leveraged on antigens that have both variable and low antigen density? And we did exactly that. This is also some work that we've done in the context of the 45 color panel, which is we've done these single color drop-ins. And so if you think back to this table of SSM and ROSOM, I can drop in one label at a time and I can actually look at the impact and say, okay, well, what is the impact of putting in that label? And what does that look like in terms of, it, uh, in terms of its spread uh, characteristics? And will it affect the resolution of the other markers I have in this experiment. And remember at the end of the day, that's what's critical, right? Is, is the resolution of those, of those markers and, and, and ensuing the, those populations. And so the way that we've looked at this is actually, well, what is the change in the spillover spread, right? What is the change in those row sums? If I drop a new marker in, what changes? In other words, I mean, quite literally to just, again, call it out, call it what it is. What am I screwing up in my ability to resolve markers? And so we're, we've taken this down more to implications here. This is the Nova Blue single, single color drop in, you know, we found here, you know, you, we, that we had a spillover uh, spreading increase for BB515 and FITSI. And it's really because we're cramming the B1 and B2 channels on this instrument. BB515 and FITSI is very, very challenging, right? And so that's why you've seen probably some previous panels where they put them on, on alternating uh, or alternate phenotypes. And it really just honestly, in this case, it's just not possible to cram anything more into the B1 and B2. We'll show you in our panel design that we've dropped BB515 out of these panels to uh, ameliorate this problem and then can move the antigen that was on BB515 elsewhere, right? And that removes some of this other spillover characteristics, for instance, in the violet that we see with the brilliant blue, the brilliant blue dyes. And the implications of these plots, which is where you're not seeing any change in spread, is that you have spillover free upgrades. And in fact, that's exactly what customers are doing now, right? Which I think takes us to really a new place, hopefully in, in considering our panels where you, know, you could design a panel and there's several more markers you wanna put in them, put in there, and now you can actually do that. And then, you know, across all of these things, across all of the other three, three yellow dyes, you actually see marginal spillover changes in labels that, that they replace in conventional cytometry, right? And so you see those increases, but they can still be used together again, as we'll actually show you again in this 45 color data. We generated and shared all of this data uh, for what it's worth, both the raw, the deconvoluted data, um, as well as, as the analysis. But I think the more important update to this is what, where are we now and what's in progress? And then I'll really, I'll hand it off to Seth to discuss this notion of iterative panel design. Because the question is, and really where we're driving to is, what can you do with fluorescence labels that are engineered for low spread, right? And so really where, we've, where, where, the, where the field has been, and so in this gray is possible with traditional dyes has been shown and published in, in terms of deep immunophenotyping. And by deep, I mean 
let's focus in on one immune population, right? Even a subpopulation of dendritic cells, for instance, we were something that we're working on with a customer. And how deep can you go? And really, you know, you end up with this 20 color, uh, 20 color limit, at least in terms of what we've seen that's feasible. Implemented with Nova floors now, right? We're up, we're up into, uh, we're up into 24, and we're, you know, we're approaching now being able to do 28 uh, on on one population, really in, in progress with with Nova floors. And the point there is that if you have low spread floors, you can actually examine multiple co-express markers because of the the spread performance, right? And that's on deep immunophenotyping. What we'll cover today is the ability to do broad immunophenotyping, right? Uh, others have shown that you can do a 40 color panel with traditional labels. Now what we've shown is that if you've got uh, implemented with Nova floors, both on a replacement basis and an addition basis, you can get to 45, although there is work in progress with customers to actually get up to, to 52, right? And again, if you have low spread floors, in this case, you can leverage more of the instrument capability. So with that, I think I'll probably describe step one and, uh, and hand it off to Seddon here to really describe some of our hit lists if that works for you, Seddon. But really, the, you know, step one is really how can we remove the dyes that are introducing spread and really think about going in and replacing those with, with clean Nova floors? Yeah, so um, one of the things I was looking at in terms of um, our original like 40 color data was where, you know, where are the places where there are dyes that are introducing spread um, into the panel. So looking at that uh, spectral spread matrix and I found um, three things I wanted to target. Um, CD3 BV510, CD86 BV515, which we already mentioned. Uh, CD, part of the reason, you know, BV510 having that broad spread into the violet. And then also uh, CD4 CF568, you can see that already we have three things in the YG1 and it, you know, looked uh, like, you know, if we're gonna continue to build into the yellow green, that would be a good place to target. Oh, so, um, so we can come back so, yeah. to that. Maybe you should target these first. Yeah. So, um, so this is basically showing the the 34 color backbone before we drop in any of the Nova floors. And what you can see here is that you know BV510 is clearly introducing um, or has a lot of spread. And then um, basically the Fitzy, um, even with just BV515 alone in that area, is already tight. So once you throw in the Nova Blue 530, um, that gets a lot worse. So as I mentioned, the, those are the um, targeting BB510, um, BB515 actually, because it is so bright and would have you know, possibly more spread into a overall panel and uh, then CF568 and CD4. So um, what you can see here is actually, this is a change in the spectral spread matrix. So going from, um, you know, taking those out of the panel, you can see that by taking BB515 out, you have a huge reduction in the spread of uh, Fitzy as well as um, some of this area with the um, CF568, you actually, you know, see this reduction in spread of a number of floors in the off the yellow green laser. Um, a little less reduction uh, over in the violet. That's probably because there's other floors that are also spilling in there. Yeah, and this is really interesting because we've discussed this concept of removing spread and then going in and replacing. And I think in many ways, you know, this is also what you would expect, right? When you have a dye like BB510, which again is, is characteristic in the notion that it might be narrowly excited, but really broadly emissive. You know, BB515, I think, you know, we see some of the, we see some of the signal that we've got in the violet. But then, yeah, as you know, right, uh, quite a bit of signal, bright signal uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the early B detectors. And then CF568, you can see actually you've got, um, you know, you've got signal both, both, within, the, both within the blue here um, as, well as, uh, as well as violet here. And so um, and actually that should be yellow, green, and, and violet. Yeah. But anyway, removing those um, really, gives you this, really gives you this view into, well, what can you do now that you can change up essentially the backbone panel? Yeah. So then, then after looking at that, this is actually, you know, it going from the 40 color to what do you have left if you take those floors out? And you can see that the next target is pretty obvious because um, PE Sci-5 is right there, um, basically um, has a lot of spread. And it's also likely impacted by the fact that we've also built out um, basically with the Nova Blue 660 and Nova Yellow 660. So places where it could be detected in are also occupied. So this was a, a pretty obvious place to also target, so. Yeah, and I'd say something we didn't anticipate, right? We went in with the goal of dropping out three labels, replacing and then upgrading the panel and then identify PE side five. 
both because of its spread performance, but also because of tandem dive stability, right? Because I think one of the other things too that we've we've discussed and, and we'll bring it back around is this notion of what about the practical considerations of having, for instance, a master mix that has this many antibodies in it, right? And just to hone in on that for a second, right? I mean, we've shown previously and, and just shared some published data, right? That you get the breakdown of these tandem dyes in solution that they can decouple differently on, on different cell types. But I think one of the other things too that we're really focused in on is how do you take an experiment, for instance, the one that's said and ran on 45 colors, but then make it something where you can actually do it and then keep it as a big master mix or put it on cells and fix it <laughs> and then go back to the instrument later, as opposed to having to do what she'll describe is essentially a mad dash right before staining because of the floor force. And I think that's an important point, right? There's no, there's nothing else. There's nothing about the instrument. There's nothing about the cells that is forcing you to, 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 you know, to sweat into your master mix as you're making it right before or two hours before it has to all do with, in this case, with the floor force. The other thing too, though, is remember these tandem dyes, other than, you know, their baseline instability also break down in this fixative solution, right? So that's the other, uh, the other component of this. And, you know, also the other thing that we've seen and, and we've, we've publicly shared our, our manufacturing data is that they also have lots of, a lot of variability, right? And so if you're going to run this panel several more times, you can't have the ground shifting underneath you. Just to put a pin in that for a second, we've shown that our labels are, are uh, stable, actually in fixative for two weeks. So this is labels, stain cells that were left uh, in 2% paraformaldehyde for two weeks. In this case, we're just staining fresh T cells and we're comparing those freshly stained to those that have been left in fixative for two weeks. We do not see any, any, you know, we don't see any difference in the signal that we're getting off of those cells, right? So not only can you fix these, but you can fix them and leave them, right? And so I think what I get excited about is the ability to actually replace an entire panel across all five lasers, right? And then of course, be able to fix it and run it later and have it be at a large number of colors. We've also taken a look at this, by the way, on the Attune, just to see what the spectral stability is. And yes, we've got to run this on an Aurora. We have several users now who have access to, for instance, an IE 7000. So equally as excited to take a look at what is the fixative stability uh, in, uh, as you look across the entire spectrum, but taking a look at the attune data as, as a first indication of, of what's going on there in, in fixative, they're also spectrally stable, right? So a, a equally, uh, as, as important and hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll ease the, the experimental workflow burden as well. The other thing too, though, is we also have shown that these are, that the conjugates themselves are actually room temperature stable. So we quite literally just left our conjugated antibodies again, which we'll describe in a moment. And we'll also show some, some brand new master mix data as well for these antibodies. Um, but left them in a, in a lab bench for two weeks, and there's actually no difference in the, in the signal, right? So, so I think that, you know, again, when we swing back around on practical considerations, we think a lot around fixative stability, we think a lot around just practical use considerations. And the final one that I think bears mentioning is also just compensation, and we talked about the use of proper controls. Remember that tandems put an enormous downward pressure, an enormous selective pressure, if you will, on your ability to compensate these data, you certainly, on, on these data. You certainly can't use two different uh, you know, conjugates, even if they're the same specificity from two different vendors, you, you can't use two different specificities. I think we all know that you certainly can't use two different lots, which we think is honestly uh, somewhat uh, in, in just insane from a workflow perspective. Um, you can't use those that have been fixed with those that aren't. I think we can, we can examine that. I think we, that's pretty obvious to us. The one that scares me the most though is, you know, if you have a lot that's newly purchased of a, of a conjugate that has a tandem on it and you've got a lot that's one month old, that they're fundamentally different. Right, and that you can't compensate. And I think that that's actually insane, right? When we think about that from a workflow perspective and, and just the practical aspects of what it takes to build up a, a panel. And so, so we've moved fundamentally beyond that, right? Um, yeah, I think questions. the second part, yeah, please go ahead. Um, so one of the questions is, you know, is, is there a paper published? So what we did was um, actually make the 40 color data available um, as, as a white paper and then also available online on both the Phytonics uh, GitHub page as well as the uh, flow repository. Um, so yeah. you, you can actually go and look at that data yourself. Um, so that yeah, and I was, think, I was thinking about this in the context of the 45 color data too, and because I figured I knew this question was going to come up. And I think what I, what I think would be, and again, this is open for feedback, right? And because I think we're trying to engage on this is I think what's more interesting to consider in this context is essentially the methods of what does the iterative panel design look like and how do you think around iterating through that and if you will simulating okay well what could a panel be and then working through that and leveraging and really again leveraging spread as the north star there and saying okay if you can do that what is the impact of doing that and then how do you also leverage that to characterize labels so so we'll see where that where that goes hopefully I think the methods part to me is, is, is equally as interesting. And then we'll describe too. And again, this is open for feedback, right? It's the first time anybody's ever seen this um, is also the antibody printing component. And how does that all, how does that all work together to create a, a large panel? So hopefully, hopefully interesting. And, and again, yeah, I'm, I'm literally spitballing. So 
Um, so maybe we can have a discussion around what that what that means uh, uh, towards the end. But I think how you get here is 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 is, is interesting as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, I think ultimately we will um, make that available, but we are actually working on iterating to make the panel actually good enough um, for the standards. <laughs> so that, that's the other issue. And really, it's just a lot of data to analyze. So that's, that's <laughs> what's going on. Um, so one person did ask on what instruments um, can you use the 45 color panel? So this is this is done on Aurora. Um, so it is definitely designed for a spectral instrument um, that's, you know, sort of Pretty yeah, I think, I think that being said, when we when we talk to people who are on a, I think what's useful about it when you think about a conventional cytometer is you can think about what you would remove and replace, right? It is the same paradigm um, in terms of that, that iteration. Um, and then it's just lining those up to the detector arrays, right? And in fact, it's interesting because on, even on something like a Cytoflex and LSR2, right? Or the more we're looking at panels, you end up with actually multiple options there, which you can optimize, right? Because we might have floors that are only 10 nanometers different. <laughs> that have, and you're, you might have a band pass that's 40, 40 nanometers, right? And so you actually have several different options as you can, in many ways you can optimize even where the excitation wavelength is relative to the spread, the underlying, and the, and the panel you're actually trying to design, right? And so, so I think, you know, we've tried to push this limit to say like, look, this is, this is what's possible. But I think for us, for Sedna, it really gives us a handle on, okay, how would we take this and then go into any other instrument? Because it enables us to character. I mean, that, that's the, the, honestly the beauty of doing this is it's a characterization um, yeah. assay. Yeah. for this and then how it behaves over their floors. So yeah. hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, so we have a few other questions. Um, how do you categorize this die? I mean, I guess in some ways, Nova floors are just slightly different. I don't know if Mike has a easy answer yeah. for that. <laughs> yeah, how, we, how do we characterize these labels? I think benchmarking is another way of thinking around this question. So the way that we- Categorize I mean, we, the, the- Oh, categorize these dies. Yeah. Ah, interesting, okay. Um, yeah, they don't, they don't fit in any family, right? So like, they're not tandems. They, they're not, you know, they're not standard organic dyes that have been with us for a long time that have a new name. They're not Alexa dyes that have a new name. They're brand new, right? In the notion that their, their spectral profiles are gonna be, are gonna be new and they're gonna behave in new ways, right? And so, so we, to that point though, I guess maybe the, the flip side of that question is we've done a lot to benchmark these versus X and, X and fluoroforce. Right, so we put out a four four selection guide, and, and the way that we think around benchmarking these is in terms of actually, again, spillover spreading, right, and then also separation index. And yes, those are and separation index as a measure of underlying signal intensity because those are without a doubt related. So, um, so I've got a couple other questions here in the in the uh, in the uh, in the chat here. Maybe I can throw them at you, said, and we can keep it keep it interactive. Yeah. Um, this is great and it works in PBMC. However, autofluorescence plays differently in non lymphoid tissues, but you know beyond PBMCs. It'd be important to look at tissues like mouse liver or lung or kidney. And I yeah. think yeah. taken. Yeah. I definitely agree. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's interesting. We had this question actually yesterday, and and you know, I think the other point there too is, you know, when you don't have the confounding impact of um, of a lot of secondary channel fluorescence, um, and you could have a lower, if you will, if you had a lower number of markers, you should be able to hopefully characterize the autofluorescence better, right? And so I think again, that's a that's something we've got to look at. Um, uh, we've got another question here, which is photo stability. Um, we've not done any of our own independent photo stability testing yet. We're starting to do that actually in the context of, of imaging. Um, in terms of, I would say, some sort of standard light testing, um, they're just as photo stable as what else is, is out there. I think we're interested in, in pushing that a little bit harder. Um, next question is, do you need a rerun of your reference control when getting a new vial of antibody? Uh, not in, an, in our case, um, but you no. do in other cases, unless the machine has fundamentally been changed that to be, you know, that it, it will change every floor, but no. Yeah. And in fact, it's, this question is great because in fact, we do publish our manufacturing data and have shown that the lot to lot data on our floor force, as well as our conjugated antibodies is within 5% variability, which is this, which is the instrument variation on a spectral floor mirror. Right. So, so I think that our goal is that you wouldn't have to change that reference sample, but also that you wouldn't even, the point would be, you shouldn't have to go in and characterize this in the way that you have to characterize other antibodies to be like, okay, well, how different is this lot or how different even is this vial of antibody, right? Because I think that honestly, that's, that's kind of insane. Yeah. And then we still have a few other questions. Um, so the status of Nova floors for intracellular marker detection. Um, I would say, I just want to feel comfortable. I've uh, worked out some blocking conditions. The main issue seems to be in the nucleus, which 
is not incredibly surprising because there are a lot of proteins that are made just to bind onto DNA. Um, I think that we've seen some some good preliminary results, so we'll probably be presenting more of that soon. Um, yeah, we've shown that we can stain interferon gamma with low background, and we've shown that we've stained, we can stain FOXP3. And mm -hmm. so I'd say you're right, we've got this proof of concept data we're looking at, obviously repeating that, doing that over a larger number of samples, but yeah. Um, so then a question, uh, do we have any panels master mixes to improve resolution on a lower end instrument like the LSR and max quant? Uh, there will be a, um, a coming um, webinar for um, looking more, more at conventional panels. So um, that I think we'll focus on that in that uh, particular one that's going to be presented by Anson. Um, yep. So I'm just going to try and keep the train moving here. I know yeah. we've got a bunch of other questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we'll, we'll come back on those and, and make sure we, we cover all those at the end. Um, and so, yeah, I, but I wanted to just keep us focused on the last part of this iteration, which is, you know, we can iteratively remove the, those that are that are introducing those spread, right? So in other words, PSI 7 which was, if you will, like a surprise for us to say, hey, look, you know, I think we can go back in there and replace that, and we can actually do that, right? And then said, and also said, okay, well, given that, we can also now upgrade this panel, right? And so, obviously a large number of Nova 4 conjugated antibodies here now where we can also also test and characterize these labels. And so again, we'll keep firing those questions away and we'll swing back around on them. I'll try and move very quickly through the manufacturing part. Maybe then we'll pause, answer some questions and then dive into the 45. Does that work for you, Sudden? Yep, that sounds great. <laughs> cool. So uh, I will, I'll move through this part quickly, but this is like, okay, well, how do, you make, how do you make it? How do you make all the stuff that has to go into this, right? Because you've got a set of, set of a large, you have 17 unique colors, 19 labels. And you've got a set of antibodies now, right? And you've got to satisfy, uh, you know, demand. Besides that, how do you actually do any of that? And the answer is, is that we've come up with, in essence, a printing system. And so we'll show you actually the, the data on this, and then why this is impactful for the field. Hopefully, um, is that we can take any of our Nova floors, right, which live in this phyton form, and they have a single strand of DNA off at the end of this, and then we can store or modify any antibody that comes into us with a polynucleotide, and then we can quite literally print them out. Right. And so I'll show you actually how we do this in two different contexts, one for what we have in stock and then also for, you know, said and essentially, uh, you know, acting uh, as a customer and saying, OK, how many antibodies do you need? OK, let's put them into this workflow. But I think, to again, to take a step back on this for a moment is, you know, when you look at any other manufacturer, the way that they're conjugating uh, floor force to antibodies is they're adding an excess floor for that's the excess stoichiometry, five to one, ten to one. That unreactive fluorophore must be removed. And actually, in certain customs programs, it's not, so you end up with free dye in solution. But it, it results in the spread of degree of labeling. Degree of labeling, the equivalent word of dye to protein or you know fluorophore to, to antibody. And in fact, you can even see this if you look, uh, you know, in your antibody catalogs, you'll see these statements like typical F to P ratio three to seven to one. To me, that's I, I didn't you know until we dug in on this, I thought we just sort of accepted it. But what it really means is that there's a Poisson distribution of fluorophores actually that are conjugated to that antibody. So you have variability that hampers your ability to do quantitation even before you ever get onto the cytometer. For things like PE, not really a problem, right? PE is 240 kilodaltons. It essentially occludes the ability for other PE molecules to be attached to that, that antibody. But for other fluorophores that are much smaller than that, it's a pretty big issue, right? Then you end up with this Poisson distribution again, fundamentally limiting your ability to do quantitative, quantitative flow. What we've done, um, is actually, uh, you know, shown the ability for us to do a one-to-one -one conjugation. So we can take any antibody, polynucleotide, modify it, and then we can come back and label it with just one phyton, right? So we have a known, known spectral characteristic, right? Known spectral clarity of these dyes, known number of dyes, and now we have exactly one phyton on one antibody, right? So it is a precise degree of labeling, right? And we actually generate a data packet for these antibodies that shows that this is one-to-one, -one, right? Um, and then this is actually what we leverage for actually all of the conjugated antibodies that we offer now. And then as I'll show you, we can leverage that to actually expand colors. We can also use that to validate any antibody that we get in and then move it onto another color as part of this printing regime. So to that point, again, this is actually what's, what, what, what's backing all this up. But of course, the thing that comes out when we say this is people say, well, prove it. Okay, fine. <laughs> Fair enough, right? We're definitely, don't take our word for it uh, uh, type company, hence, hence, the, hence the, the, the bolus of data here. But what we did is actually, the first part of this would just be for what we have in stock. So I thought an easy example would be something like CD4, right, SK3. So we have CD4 and we actually need the ability to print that across uh, the six BYG that I have shown you. And in fact, that's exactly what we do. We actually leverage this, this manufacturing regime. 
to produce our CD4 kits for both mouse and human. And in fact, you can see now that we can actually just print these across all the colors, right? And so that's like, okay, I get it. You can be able, you can do that on CD4, but what can you do if I've got antibodies that aren't that? And so set and put an enormous pressure on this system, right? So this was the new antibodies that she wanted and the floors on which she wanted them, right? And so, which is good, it's good to be demanding, right? And so this is what backs up our panel. But if you think about it, it's more than just doing the panel design. It's like, okay, how do you actually satisfy having this suite of colors across this suite of specificities, right? And so I'm gonna pull out some examples here, but what we are able to do here, and this is exactly what we follow for, now, for our, uh, our, customer, uh, our customers now as well, is what we do is conjugate the oligo to the antibody. So for instance, anti-CD40 will get an oligo. We then purify that oligo conjugated antibody. We leverage one-on-one phyton antibody labeling with Noviello 610, right? So we actually use one dye to determine that antibody concentration, right? And that also validates the, the polynucleotide modification of the antibody. We run in flow cytometry versus a commercially available antibody that has the exact same clone, right? So we validate the specificity of that and we say, okay, yep, that's, that's good. And we're, we're getting the labeling there. Um, and then we attach the desired four because once we've got that validated, remember, more than 90% of the mass of these phytons is DNA, right? And we know that we're already getting that complement complement interaction. And then we can print that not only on the next color, but as you've seen, several colors all at once. And then we provide conjugated antibodies, not at tests, but a known concentration, right? Here is the exact concentration of the antibody that you need, and they're one-to-one -one labeled. So you actually do have the ability uh, you know, to, to, to leverage these in a quantitative system. So we did that. Actually, this is actually part of the, the validation matrix, if you will, where we're taking a look at all these polynucleotide modified uh, antibodies uh, of this large menu that we've got. And, and actually, in each case, every one of these has now been printed, if you will, where they've got a, an antibody that's been conjugated with an oligonucleotide. We printed on the Noviello of 610 and then ran them in flow. And so I want to pull out just some examples of that, um, not, to bolt, not to just hammer you with histograms, right? Just to show you the way that we look at this and then what we would essentially deliver back in, into Satin or what we've delivered to other customers as part of this program, right? Where we can take a look at something like you know, CD40, uh, you know, clone 5C3, and we actually can, you know, characterize this and, and show what, what does the staining look on lymphocytes versus something like APC, what does it look like on monocytes, you can do some benchmarking, again, to what's commercially available uh, and, and out there, and so you are getting, you know, validating that you're getting, uh, validating you're getting, getting what you, uh, getting what you think you're getting in that printing system, and then once this is in the system, if you think about it, I already have polynucleotide modified CD4, I can do it on any of our colors. Right. And so the same story applies for something like CD44, again, a benchmark against a commercially available antibody. CD86, again, benchmark against a commercially available antibody. Um, and CD115, same story. Um, CD141, I didn't realize I included so many of these in here. But the point is, is that now that we've got that, now that we have all these specificities in, not only do we have the ability to print them on any color, but we can also take in any antibody from any customer and do exactly the same thing. And I think this is where it gets really exciting. So this is to put some, some practical aspects on what does that even mean? And so hopefully it's a bit of a different customs program than you've ever than, than you've seen before. You know, you would provide us with 500 microgram of your antibody. Uh, you'd get us a purified antibody concentration of over uh, uh, one, uh, one microgram per mil. That's what's preferred. We can work underneath that as said and as noted for me uh, early this morning. No stabilizing proteins. PBS with no sodium acide is, per is preferred. Final conjugates actually provided at a known concentration of 100 microgram per mil in PBS with a low concentration of ASI. And we offer some QC guarantees, right? So this is, you know, what are, where, what are we stepping up to the plate on? The Nova floors will all be specially QC. That's something that we're very uh, intense about in terms of lot to lot consistency and making sure that the Nova floors are, are bang on every time. We'll also confirm that conjugate by gel. Um, there's also an option to make sure that we can confirm that that, that it's binding on the antigen that, that, you, that you expect it. Obviously that becomes antigen dependent. Uh, purity guarantees, no free antibody. Uh, labeling stoichiometry optimized to avoid free phyton. Remember, because we're doing a one-to-one -one incubation here, you, uh, the, the amount of free dye, if any, is incredibly low, right? This is not a five to one or 10 to one. Um, and then timeline is maximum three weeks uh, once received. And so I, I'm seeing the questions. I, I, we will, I, I promise that we will, we will come back to that um, uh, towards the end. And I think this is, to me, this is exciting too, because now you can think about once you've got the antibody that you provide into this regime, then it can be printed across really any of the colors. So again, three weeks or less, we can provide those conjugated antibodies at a known concentration, not just test and one-to-one -one label. So I, I thought I would turn over just a little bit of the practical aspects too to set in. This is her reading from the book, the new book that's just coming out, Zen and the Art of Master Mixes. I particularly appreciated that actually. I really 
I've always liked the uh, the other version of that book, but it definitely, um, Mike was, you know, hearing, we, we sometimes talk about some of the, you know, obstacles we run into as being uh, market research. So <laughs> there's a sense of, you know, planning for the 45 plus kind of uh, color panel. So, of course, the initial set of just getting all of those antibodies physically there. So there's, you know, our end, and then there's, you know, if you're sourcing those from other vendors, um, are they back ordered? So, you know, not necessarily you don't know this in advance. So, do you design around a back order? You know, is it available in the floor that you want? So, you know, is it, you know, you realize, okay, this is not a good area. Now you've got to order another antibody and try to move this around. Um, so, and then another pain point, I guess, would be, you know, as you're making this master mix, um, it's incredibly um, nerve wracking to, you know, you start, if you start thinking about, you know, how expensive and ex whatever this experiment is, and then you, you get into this, you know, um, sort of issue of, you know, how stable are the, the floors over time, but also this idea with the BUVs and BVs, which, you know, really did, um, come into play because you have, you know, two hours. So you add the brilliant buffer and you have two hours before there starts to be some, you know, cross labeling or exchange and 24 hours for the BVs. So it gives little breathing room for errors. And one of the things that, you know, I'll mention here is as I was going through um, the panel, I realized I was short on one of the antibodies. I can't set, set, set that master mix around even if, you know, it, it has to be done that day. Um, so it's, you know, it's uh, definitely nerve wracking as you're doing that, trying not to make sure <laughs> make a mistake and you've titrated all of those antibodies. Um, and then if you, you know, and this is where I ran into really part of that problem was this repeats and iteration. So, you know, making sure that you have all the antibodies, um, but also like some of, I had a few antibodies where um, if I didn't pre-order them, they took two, two to three months to come in. Um, just because they were back ordered at, at the vendor. And of course, during COVID, that's, you know, not, you know, worse than, than even normal situations. But um, if you think about Nova floors, one of the really nice things is that our customs panel allows you to easily swap out the floor. So you're like, okay, this is too bright for what I need. I need to move it somewhere else. Really easy to switch that around, which is pretty exciting. Um, the idea of having really stable Nova floors so you don't have the issues that you have with tandems. And um, this, you know, hint that uh, it's possible to use as a master mix. So I think all of that's really exciting to me, having done the hands-on physical <laughs> nerve wracking part. Yeah, and in fact, so we've just started testing master mixes. So we thought we'd throw in some of our preliminary data there as well, just looking at, well, because it comes up as a question for the Nova Fours, you know, are, how stable are they in master mixes? And as you can appreciate, setting is very actively uh, in a very socially distanced manner, twisting arms in the lab to say, like just how long can these go for in master mixes? Cause that would make my life so much easier net of having all the other ergonomic improvements, right? That we have here, right? And so this is just fresh co-staining and this is master mix that's been stored in the fridge for two hours and actually master mix has been stored at room temperature. And so yeah, so not only are we testing out much longer times, of course, right? But I think the other critical point here is we also wanna see what does it look like at, at four degrees and also room temperature, right? And so, you know, what what is the storage of a master mix? And going back to that, going back to that, uh, uh, going back to, to that question that we had uh, earlier, you know, I think it'd be for us, it's important also to think around, okay, could you have master mixes available of different Nova floors on different antigens and then be able to lyophilize them, right? Or just be able to ship them. So, uh, you know, something that we think a little bit, bit around, but I think right now we're really focusing on like, okay, how do you, how, how would you print them and just print and ship, right? Um, so, so with that, um, I'm, I'm super excited about the number of questions, but I really want to make sure that we just cover <laughs> the, the 45 color data <laughs> itself. So um, we, we hope, I, I, this is, I don't know, I'm having, a, I'm having, we're having too much fun. I don't know, maybe that's the problem. Um, and so, um, but yeah, I want to just cover some of the aspects, uh, you know, set in on, on some of the panel design characterization uh, that she's doing on this 45 color uh, data. I'll show you some of the consistency uh, between the panels and then show you some of the, the, uh, the, the start of the analysis that we're doing on this. And then we'll swing back around and we'll, we'll hang out for, for hopefully a, a uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes and, and answer our, uh, all the questions that we have. Is that work for you, Seddon? Yep, absolutely. Sweet. All right, go for it. Right, so this is just showing you the overall spectral spread uh, matrix from our original 40 color panel uh, with the, you know, spectral spread. So you can see here the BV510, BV um, BV515, and PE-Sci5, um, you know, 
creating some of those issues as well as, you know, the CF568, which, uh, you know, just spills sort of over this entire area, which you can't, you know, you can't quite see there being a specific problem. Um, in this new 45 color panel, I, I, I figured we, were, we would have issues partly because we don't have any, <laughs> you know, we haven't yet built into the UV and violet. And so we're gonna have to put some more pressure on to, you know, basically the, um, you know, yellow green, but you can see that it's, that's really no different from the 40 color. There is one issue right here and that's these both fluorescent in the R1 channel and, um, you know, both APC and Nova Red 660. And then you have two, uh, you know, Alexa Fluor 647, which is in the R2 and then APC R700 in the R3. So you just got a lot of stuff going on there. Yep, yep. I guess, you know, I think one of the, remember going back to our point around dyes pushing on hardware, Please give us more detectors in the red. We, we, we want more in the red. <laughs> Make t-shirts. Um, so that's it's, it's a weird t-shirt to say because it's essentially, in, you know, it's like, you don't want, in business, you want to be in the black, right? Not in the red, but we want more in the red. So think differently. I think the other thing too that I wanted to point out, this was, I think, hopefully a surprise slide for Seddon was, was it was also down to the, the way the experiment's executed, but also down to the consistency of the Aurora. And so, you know, it, it's credit where credit is due on that instrument where, you know, I was analyzing the data, uh, but, and I had 45 and, and 40 colors open and could essentially exchange the gates, right? And, and change it up for, for the parameters that we had. But I thought, and this, this again is just diving into the first part of the phenotype and we got to work it all the way down the tree. But I was really, really impressed, right? I mean, there, you're going to have scattered differences in between different donors here, right? We're working with human PBMCs, you know, with, not considering that. The, the ability to quite literally, if you will, transfer gates over make some adjustments and do this side by side. Uh, you know, I was able to phenotype this and do 32 phenotypes, not making this up within about an hour and 15 minutes, right? And that's not just because like, I, I know a little bit about Flojo. It's quite literally because it's so consistent. You can drag and drop the gates on, use any of your previous analysis as a reference and keep going. And I think, again, I want to give a lot of credit here to the, the way the experiment was done, but also the fact that you do have an instrument that's incredibly consistent over time, right? And I think that, that that's another piece of this puzzle and you, you can't, can't, can't move away from, from that either. And so, of course, you know, these things were fizzing. I was like, oh, I can't wait to dive in on this data. Like, what does this even look like? And so, so I've taken, it's tip of the iceberg, right? But it's, it's incredibly exciting for me to just be able to start looking at this data because the amount of biological diversity you're able to pull out with 45 colors, you know, it's not just having five more colors, right? It's having low spectral spreading on some of your current phenotyping markers. And also the fact that you've got now five markers that you can then look across a, a range of all of these different phenotypes, right? And so we're we're going to go through that full workup. But I, I really wanted to give you guys a first sense of okay, well, how's you know how's this looking in terms of okay, well, what does the CD fifteen one fifteen expression look like? Are we able to pull out some of the diversity in, in CXCR four expression or CD forty? And the answer is you know yes, right? And it's it's fun to be able to start seeing some of the biological diversity there. And I think the other important thing to consider here is that you're able to see these differences, but Note too that the differences in the fluorophores, or I'm just showing you just the nova fluorophores here, are gaps of 10 or 20 nanometers in terms of their excitation, right? And so we are down, we're down in the margin. We're able to phenotype things, right, and and hit and even leverage that off adjacent detectors or detectors that are incredibly close to one another, right? And remember, you know, as excited as I can get about the analysis, at the end of the day, it's got to come down to the biology and the resolution that we can get from these fluorophores. Similarly, you know, and I know this the legend is is not good. Um, is you know we were able to take all the phenotypes that we've shown previously that are actually shown behind me here from the 40 color data um, and actually again back go back in and map those uh, into this uh, uh, you know into this uh, in, into this data as well. You can see again you know it's interesting because this also shows you you know what TCN is good at and what it's not good at right um, in terms of the deep phenotyping that we can get out from this right and there's obviously a lot more going on that lay beneath the surface here on this data in terms of the, the depth of phenotyping you know to that point I've run. You know, two different types of clustering analysis on this. You know, FlowSOM essentially at the dendritic cell gate level, which includes a lot of lymphocytes and, and the monocytes. In fact, it's funny here because this pop, you know, this these meta clusters really end up being dominated entirely by the T cell diversity, and that's because of the bias that we have in the panel, right? I mean, if you think about all the markers that we have in there and a lot of the chemokine receptors, a lot of those are being expressed in the T cells, and so you end up with this large meta cluster, meta cluster two that is those T cells. But the beauty of this data set, and again, leveraging on the fact that we've got a lot of these on those, those clean floors, is the fact that I can go in and essentially zoom in just on the T cells and then blow that out, right? And so, and begin to look at actually the population diversity with respect to the T cells, right? And so, so again, I think for us, it's this notion of, okay, where, you know, let's take this down the tree and really perform some both some supervised and also unsupervised analysis 
to really take a look at this, right? And really be able to build out a bigger story around, okay, well, what happens when you do have the ability to uncover this kind of population diversity? So it's so exciting. I think hopefully a first indication of, of what we're up to um, uh, with the data set and, and some, some exciting work there. I also wanted to put a plug in essentially for what we're thinking around in terms of the future. And it's a question that's come up a lot, right? Which is something that we haven't mentioned for almost the entire talk, which is that we, yeah, we've got lots of floors, that's great, but we also have the ability to have digital fluorescence. We can control the brightness of our labels. And a question that's come up several times for us, and it's one that's been, it's another one of these things that's been bothering us, is could different brightness of the versions of the NOFORs actually be used for phenotyping? In other words, could you actually add dimensionality even within one detector, right, for non-co-expressed markers? And to put a pin in that, if you will, we, you know, we've got two different brightness versions of Nova Blue 610, two different brightness versions of Nova Yellow 660, right? We've developed a, a, a some more dynamic range, you know, in the meantime for these, for these, for these types of labels. But when we think about building this out across a set of floors, could you imagine there being another dimension, essentially, which is also this dimension of brightness? So to look at that, we actually did leverage one tool that's that's useful for doing floor four comparisons, although we find it to be a little bit less useful um, for, for doing, uh, or less useful than spillover in looking at panel design, which is similarity index. Either you're glazing over right now or you're getting really excited. There's only, there's only this is a very divisive, divisive slide. Um, for the biologists like me, because um, I always used the word when I worked with Joseph Spidlin, I was like, don't have a slide with all math. And so mea culpa, Joseph, I, that's exactly what I just did. The point of, of a similarity index here is to be able to consider, can you actually deconvolute two floors that could have very, very similar signatures? That's it, right? And so we wanted to actually assess this for the two different brightness versions that we have to see, okay, could you, in theory, use these for phenotyping different markers that might not be co-expressed? And so in this case, we're comparing the 30S and 70S Nova Blue 610, looking at their different, their different signatures here. These are signatures that we've generated just off of the, the raw Aurora data. Same thing for Nova Blue 660, right? And we've got a similarity indices that are quite high, as, which is exactly what you'd expect, right? And so, you know, for us, it's proof something to be in the pudding. Are we going to try it? Absolutely. And then we can also see, okay, for instance, is, you know, what does it look like if you can change just a part of the spectrum? And does that give you some similarity difference, right? Um, where you could actually do that within the same, uh, uh, the, same, the same detector, right? And so I think it gives you just the first scratching of the surface that it could be possible. So again, in the absence of data, we're not going to make any claims on it, but I think uh, hopefully an interesting future direction for us to consider. The other future direction, of course, is the fact that we do have both on deep, deep phenotyping and also uh, broad immune phenotyping. You know, we've, we're now we're, it's, you know, it's not, you know, we've, we've done this to essentially, you know, shine the light, right? But it's really customers that are taking this ball and running with it you know, up to 28 colors on an individual phenotype, out to 52 colors for, for broad immune phenotyping. And so hopefully, you know, the other piece of this is, as I mentioned earlier on these methods, new thinking around panel design. And then what happens if you can print antibodies, right, on any color? I don't, I think we're, again, we're scratching the surface on what that capability could mean. Um, continue deeper analysis on both panel design and immune phenotyping, right? We've got these single color drop-ins where we're able to characterize every single one of the labels that we have in here in spread which I think is a useful resource for considering what they could look like back to question around conventional cytometry. And then iterative panel design tools to examine the spread removal and panel upgrading. I think that, that this notion of that being this process that's, that's iterative where you can go in and then if you will generate this hit list and say, I want to take off PE Sci-5 now, which is exactly what we went through, right? And, and begin iterating through that, I think is, is, is really intriguing. And at, in the end of the day, the reason we focus so much on spillover spreading and, and what you can get out of the, the back end biology is in the end, it's not the number of colors, right? This is not in, in, this is not a 45 color experiment, right? This is an experiment that shows you that if you use spillover as your North Star, as it should be, and treat spillover as the enemy, um, then you can design very, very clean floor fours and begin pushing the limits of, of these instruments, right? Because um, it's the resolution of the underlying biology that, that is really what matters. And that's what we are, that's what we're, we're really obsessed with. So I, I, I don't want this to be the story of 45. I want it to be the story of what can we do in panel design and what, what would happen if you could change the infrastructure and the way you can leverage those panels. So with that, um, this is the team that put it together. Huge, you know, maybe she'll bless, but like huge compliments to set in on, on executing this experiment. It was an incredible uh, uh, endeavor. And as she mentioned, you know, it's not over, right? This is work that's in progress. We don't just say, oh, 45. Yeah. All right, webinar done. That's not how this works, right? So these are, you know, these are, this is the way that we characterize our labels, the way we think around uh, uh, creating labels and how we design new labels as well. So our email addresses are up here, our catalog is up here as well. And I'm chomping at the bit here to get to a number of questions here. And so, and as you'd expect, said, and I will probably ask them of each other to keep it interactive and please keep, please keep firing away uh, uh, questions because uh, we'll hang out and, uh, uh, and answer those. 
All right. Um, so I guess I'll start asking, by asking you questions um, or just throwing them out there at least. Uh, do these eyes tolerate freezing in terms of stability performance? Um, I don't think we've tested that. So. No, we haven't tested that. So no, I don't know. Um, i trying to think. Yeah, no, we haven't tested that. I was thinking if we had tested actually just the labels on their own, but I can't remember that data off the top of my head. So to so know we haven't tested that specifically. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna um, fire back at you. You wanna do? Yeah, go for it. Does that mean, so can you use a brighter marker to replace a weaker marker on reference controls? Um, you can do a lot of things. I mean, I guess, you know, even as I was iterating this panel, for instance, let me just give you a good example. Uh, when um, our conjugation chemist was building out the um, CD95, I was like, I, I didn't, when he tested on Nova Yellow 610, which has an intermediate brightness because we have new floors that are in the red that are brighter. Um, I was like, I'm not sure if this is working as well when we were really testing it and I needed that brighter floor. Um, so I actually used the Nova Red 685, switched it out and could really separate out the biology. So it is about, you know, being able to do that. So you can do a lot of, a lot of things with being able to switch out the floors and also our, um, having the separation index on um, the Phytonics website. All right, so, um, <clears throat> Have you used DNA treatment in preparation of cells from tissues? I think we already mentioned that. Um, um, would you worry about the DNA structure even if it's downstream of the workflow with washings in between? Um, definitely need to test it, but I think we have some people that have actually tested that. And I would say um, in general that uh, really, as long as you're washing it out, um, it doesn't seem to be the issue. I wouldn't put it in there at the same time. That wouldn't be a great plan. Um, <laughs> yeah, and let's let's categorize where that where that's a problem, right? It's 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 in it's in cleaving the connection of the phyton to the antibody. The phytons themselves are incredibly stable to that because of that unnatural crossover mm -hmm. structure. But yeah, to your point, people are washing them out in you know more complex disease, you know more complex tissue uh, processing, for instance. And if it's washed out, not an issue. All right. um, we've got a question, you know, how much playable in the 500 microgram scale? Uh, I would say, well, I'll reach out to you on that, um, just because there's there's a lot more that goes into what antibody and how, how are you going to source it in and which label. And so I'll, I'll follow up on that. Um, a, a comment, a couple comments. I bet the antibody that took so long was uh, Q.800 conjugated. Um, that was one of them. There, oh, there were actually yeah, several. <laughs> not only that, but I even had someone, since we're in North Carolina, someone reach out to ask if we, we could give some of our antibody to someone at Duke because theirs was back ordered. I was like, this is yeah. crazy. I, I need our antibody. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, precious. Um, yeah, so I think another question here, what panel design can you use to include your newly designed dyes? There's no, so I, I guess the question here, that, there is no new type of panel design that you have to do. What we're doing is honestly, what we've been hopefully underlying is that traditional panel design in the use of particularly looking at spillover spreading will, will lead you to a place where you can leverage these fours and in many ways upgrade a panel. So, so the um, you know, panel design tools that, that leverage this, we do have uh, the, the spectrum of the first six BYG up on the SciTech website. They're also up on the spectrum or up on FloraFinder. Um, right, which I think Seven can speak to better than I can. Um, and then we are, you know, we're also intending at some point to build our own panel design tool when we're not doing stuff like you saw today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so from the panel on the screen, which is the dim marker using Nova Floor. So I'm not, because I'm not actually at that point in the talk, I'm not sure, but what I will say is that I, you know, just like I was mentioning for CD95 needing to build up brightness, I needed to take down some of the brightness with CD44 because it's so high in antigen density. So I use Nova Blue 585, um, but we do have all our separation indices um, on the website. So you can actually use that as well as a tool, you know, depending on your antigen density, so. Um, yeah, are the, are the newer versions like Nova Yellow 690, Nova Red 700 already, re already released for Europe too? Yes. The answer is that they're released for pre-order, so for these Wave 2 labels. Um, and so we are, at this point, the majority of those Wave 2 labels should be into, I think, CD4 kits by early December for shipping, and then conjugation kits at the end of that month. So now we're, we're within that. So for any of those, yeah, so for, I, we should have mentioned, <laughs> we should have mentioned, um, 
that there's conju there's con there's going to be conjugation kits on a one by one or microgram basis for all of the all of the labels that we have, um, and then the the we also have CD four kits for characterizing all of the labels, equally as important. Uh, and then those will be in the printing regime right around the same time in late December, right? Yeah. For for customs program, et cetera. Because once we have the labels, yeah, yeah, pretty, you know, pretty easy after that. Yeah. All right. Um, that one, yeah. Have we tried multiple barcoding with our dyes uh, because we can modify their intensity? Well, we're trying to push the limits of what we can do right now spectrally. And then I guess that is something we could do, obviously, with things like the Nova Blue 610 and uh, Nova Blue 660. Um, so, yeah, it's just a matter of kind of what, you know, is the, the limit at some point there, you know. That's yeah, it. it's going to be interesting to try like CD4, CD8, like a very a trivial experiment in many ways to see if we can do that. I think it's a really, it's a good question because, in, and I think it kind of wrapped in this question is, regardless of the similarity index, can you still be able, can you still do it? Because it doesn't, it's not actually impacting your, your interpretation off the back end, right? And the answer is we need to know, right? We hadn't, we, we hadn't run them the way that we'd run that as we've shown here. And I think that gets, that becomes pretty exciting because if you can make around stacking up and, and you know, non co express markers, um, and changing the intensity and the question, you know, the other question too, will be like, do you need different, what levels of intensity do you need, right, to, to really distinguish them? And I, I don't think we have a really good handle on that yet, to be honest. Yeah. What's going on with, I guess, is a CD 141 in terms of the negative spread. Um, I have to go back to that slide. My guess is, is that, you know, we do have a blocking solution for negatives for any of the background that we see. Um, so, Seth, you want to speak to that? Yeah, yeah, and also, um, so the when he's showing you the data from the Nova Yellow Six Ten with those tests, um, we, you know, basically by the time we're actually using the antibody and our uh, conjugation chemist is doing that, um, the um, basically we're titrating the amount of phyton. So there could also be excess phyton, which um, is not. Uh, attached to the antibody at that point. We try to do like a quick test of like, is this working? Because we want, also wanted a step of like, you know, did a chemistry already mess up the clone so we shouldn't keep going with it. There's no point in testing it, you know, there. Um, and so then, you know, after that step, then then there's a titration step to figure out how much um, phyton to be used. Yeah, smart, smart, good point. This next one's easy, can I take it? Can we get a sample of your antibodies? Yeah, let's, 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 Let's reach out about that. We do offer 25 test versions of the uh, our recommended colors, right? Which are priced exactly as you expect uh, for test versions, and and so and just depends on what you need and how we can help. So we'll we'll reach back out about that. Can you regulate the brightness of antibody? Did you try to use them to stain tissue slides and detection by microscopy? Sen, do you want that one? Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> Basically, microscopy is a whole different uh, situation because of the different ways that fluorescence, you know, if you think about, you know, um, embedded, you know, frozen sections, you know, antibodies don't even work the same between, say, paraffin fixed sections and OCT sections. I mean, you can often cross those over from flow. So that's really um, still, I think, something that we're collaborating with folks on, but um, just because of access to, um, you know, <laughs> Uh, different microscopes preparation is just not our, our core uh, competency, so. Um, all right. Are you barcoding with your conjugation technology or your dye since they're mostly DNA, can they be used directly on, for example, the 10X platform? Yeah, this is something that I spoke, uh, I'd say briefly to uh, at Cyto, but y y the answer is, um, it is it is a DNA platform. <laughs> And we can quantitatively control the floor force. As you can imagine, we could also quantitatively control any type of, you know, sequence. And so I'd say, uh, stay tuned on that. Um, how the dyes perform in ICS? Um, I think we we answered that. So we do have some preliminary data on interferon gamma staining as well as Fox V three. So we're building that we're building that suite out uh, now. We can do it with low background. Um, and the FOXP3 results were equally as really interesting in this and in the notion that you were actually able to pull out both the FOXP3 high and FOXP3 low populations. So actually had a, a population that was staining higher than what you could see with PE. So I think we've got some really encouraging results there. Um, and so now we're working with a number of customers actually to, to take a look at that as well. So if that's something that's of interest, would love to, love to know what, what's, of, what's of interest there to you um, and, and run that. 
What's the shelf life of Nova Floor conjugate antibodies? Um, I don't know yet. Um, you know, we've had, we're doing these long-term storage experiments. We've only been making conjugate antibodies for a handful of months. Um, and so quite literally don't know, right? So we're storing them in azide and we, we put an industry standard one year uh, shelf life on them, which is in line with what we've seen with previous conjugation methodologies that are leveraging oligo oligo. Um, and again, just don't know until we have 18 months or two years to, to test that, which we, we have not yet. Have you observed issues with Fred and large panels and can that happen with your dyes? The answer is no, because you know, as, as Fred scales with, with the square of distance, that Fred is occurring, the energy transfer is all occurring in a very short, a very small window of space, actually on the Phyton platform itself. And in fact, not only do you not see Fred interactions in between the dyes, but you also, each of the arms of the Phyton structure acts independently, right? So it's in fact, that the, even the next arm of the Phyton structure is too far away for Fred, right? So I think, uh, no, no issues there. Sensitivity to DNAs is, I, I, think, we, I think we answered that question uh, earlier just with respect to washing them out and then what's sensitive there. Uh, what's the cost of conjugating antibody? Uh, I, again, I would say we'll reach back out on that, on what does it look like? Because uh, it also depends if you want us to source it or you're gonna send it to us. So, um, and what does that look like? And kind of what's your spec? Um, because depending on how we QC it, et cetera, there, there's obviously different answers to that. So, um, so we'll reach out on, on that. Is there a possibility of using these in flow and IHC? Um, I think hopefully Seddon's answered that. We know we can use them in flow. We've seen some incredibly bright staining uh, in immunohistochemistry. You know, and so now we're, we're really, we're working with a team of experts now to say, because like, honestly, like, as you can see, like we're flow people. And you know, we, we thought we are like, oh, it's fluorescence, like whatever. We'll just, no, it's not, sorry, but like Im imaging is, it's a whole nother beast. And so we're working with the team of experts there to take a look at that there. They've got some encouraging early results just in terms of the brightness and the performance, but in terms of optimization, it's gonna, it's gonna take another several months there. So, I mean, hopefully we can have more to say on that, on that soon. Can you project when you'll take on UV to solve the BUV master mix timing issue? This is a huge issue. Yeah, I, this is therapy. I mean, it, it's, it's very, it's super painful. Um, again, it's, we're, we're actively in there. Um, I, I can't project when that's gonna be because um, it, 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 it's as active as it could possibly be. You know, we've been targeting 2021 for, for those. And, you know, honestly, like if you can consider the fact that maybe take solace in the fact that Seddon is in the lab every day, essentially telling people that like, look, this is insane that we have to do this two hour window thing. And that I really wanna have a master mix and I wanna have it to be stable for weeks, right? Um, and I just wanna be able to, I wanna have, for, look, honestly, like, in an ideal world, this would be a 45 color experiment, doesn't end color experiment in a master mix and you just be able to hit cells with it. Mm -hmm. Why is that so hard? Like, why is that a crazy, why is that a crazy thing to ask for? Um, so, so I think that's where we want to be. That's where we want to be heading. So we've got, we've got to meet that. Um, so hopefully sometime in the next year, but we, we've got to see, right? Because uh, we also want to land in the line with not just one, one label. Right. Also, I can say, I feel your pain if it helps. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the Zen. Um, <laughs> What's the advantage of doing the, the conjugation versus buying your conjugation kits? So they, they meet different, they meet different cases, I'd say. So what the, the, the things that we've had, the types of arrangements we've had like with customers would be, you know, they will go and test their antibody using a one by 100 microgram conjugation kit, right? Or multiple of them. And then when they, when they, they say, look, this is going to work in the panel. We've done a proof of concept assay. We we've, we've even titrated it and we say, okay, well now you want it at scale. You could either order a ton of conjugation kits. Okay, that's fine, right? And lots of hands-on time, or we can conjugate it for you, right? And so there's several advantages off the back end of that, right? I mean, the fact that we just have this printing system up and you know, arguably you're gonna get a better yield, right? And you're gonna get a, a, a shot of, of massive antibody. Um, there, there's quite a few advantages there, but I think they meet, they just meet different use cases, right? That's why that line is set at 500 micrograms, um, you know, in terms of that, that minimum starting. Do you need unique staining blocker blocking buffers for these dyes? Sen, you want to take that one? Yeah, so we we um, include Nova Block with all our orders, um, and that really seems to help uh, with the blocking out for the, for instance, the monocyte binding, similar to uh, what happens with a, a true stain. But um, yeah, this is what we recommend with our floors to get rid of any non-specific. Is there a price difference between a one floor chrome molecule and a phyton versus multiple? No. No. Um, like on the phyton itself, no, because the label is the label, right? We charge for a label. It's not like, oh, this one's got 
eight more floor floors or something on it. And so it's more expensive. That's not how it works. And in, and in many ways, what we've done for both conjugate antibodies and conjugation kits is make all of them comparable to what you're already purchasing. So, and you know, that, so that hopefully, that hopefully that answers your questions. Can you use customized sequences with engineered binding sites to intentionally quantify transcription factor binding activity? In theory, anything's possible. It's an oligonucleotide, right? Like when I used to work in software, I had one of my senior engineers who always said, you know, it's, it's software, you can do anything. And I feel like that's the same way with oligonucleotides sometimes. So it just, it comes down to the characterization of those oligonucleotides and also ensuring that they're not gonna bind up a huge amount of background oligonucleotides. In other words, off target sequences. So it's gonna get, it's gonna really come down to the sequence design there. Um, what I will say is that we know that we've got a very flexible platform and the ability to swap out, if you will, to your point, a targeting sequence. Mm -hmm. Um, the questions keep coming. I feel like I'm surfing. I don't even like surfing, but like, this is kind of what it feels like. Um, <laughs> I suppose, uh, are there any anti-aggregation reagents, uh, EDTA, DNAs, trips, and et cetera, that you suggest for people doing antibodies on tumor gut brain samples that are, uh, that are prone to aggregation? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think uh, generally I would, you know, prepare the sample, you know, EDTA is obviously great for chelation and separating out uh, a lot of the, you know, in, interactions between say monocytes, which are particularly sticky in other cells. Um, you know, DNA is really good when you're dealing with, the, you know, tumor tissue, uh, you know, gut, all, all gut, everything, you know, you need everything because you get so much stickiness there. Um, but yeah, so I, if you have any specific questions, um, but I would say, um, feel free to reach out. Um, but yeah, I have done a lot of work with those and basically you just have to use all your tricks in terms of getting that sample down to a single cell level and then, you know, wash that out, do your staining, so yeah. Yeah, I'd say on, the, on, on, on our side of it, remember I think it's an important point too, is with combinations of our four fluids, we've never seen aggregates on the floor four side, right? On the on the conjugate antibody side, right? And remember that that's the that's the that's really the push of those those brilliant stain buffers is make sure that they don't interact with one another. We just don't see that. And remember, you're looking at we've done stainings over two weeks, right? We don't we don't see these aggregates. It just doesn't happen, right? And remember, it's because of this DNA shell, right? I mean, they're not they don't they're not going to aggregate with one another just chemically. To that point, I was using that also as a segue into the next question, which is, what does the phyton look like chemically? unless it's proprietary. It's actually a lot simpler than you think. It's 90% DNA. Um, it is quite literally almost entirely DNA, right? Um, and so the, if you all, the, the, like, the, 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 the magic is, <laughs> the magic is down to like, how do you create the crossover regions? And then how do you make sure that you can get a structure that's the, as stable that has that, that geometric arrangement of the floors, right? And that's really where the, that's where the fun stuff is. Right. Um, so that's, and, and that's the stuff that would be considered to your, to your question proprietary, but it's just DNA. And for, for what it's worth, I think that's where it gets exciting for Sutton and I, because once you can prove it out in, for instance, in your cellar, or you can show it in imaging, or you can do these other things, you have a platform that you can then just scale, right. And, and leverage the performance and go up, 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 right. And, and, and scale those, scale those applications out. And so I think that's what gets incredibly exciting for us. Cause you know, as we look at, nuclear staining or you look at extending that to phosphostat or wh whatever it may be. Once we can show it on one color, then it becomes a, a simple aspect of building that. Um, I've got some other questions in the chat. Um, what's the recovery when using the conjugation kits? Do you have ice? I'll throw all of them at you. No. <laughs> <laughs> do you have isotypes? Okay. Do you have uh, isotype controls? Yeah. Okay. And, okay. Uh, Keep going. <laughs> Can you tune the fluorochromes in, in almost any way if you get if you in if you have the right chemistry? Okay. Uh, what is the recovery when using your conjugation kits? So um, we um, have basically partnered um, with with Abcam in terms of making those conjugation kits, and um, it's I think it's supposed to be 90% or 85% recovery, I think, in terms of their literature. So that's the antibody. You're not doing anything different once you are adding the phytons onto that step. We are now recommending uh, that actually you do only one precipitation because it seems like the second precipitation um, is an issue somehow. And we don't actually, because that's on their side, we don't have you know, any um, way of sort of knowing what's going on um, there as to why some antibodies, but um, precipitate or not, but there's very little change in the fluorescence. So, uh, do we have any isotype controls uh, to those antibodies that we sell? Um, we 
don't currently, but it wouldn't be hard to do. I actually in-house, actually when I was doing the controls for the interferon gamma and FOXP3 had our conjugation uh, chemist Nick uh, generate uh, those just because I knew that in intracellular, I really wanted to know, okay, if I put a nice type control in there, is that gonna give me the same fluorescence? Because I wanted, I want to convince myself. <laughs> that's, that's how strong that goes. Um, tuning these fluorochromes in almost any way. Um, so basically once we've made them, we have this, you know, it is in that um, excitation and emission spectra. So you, you yourselves would not be able to, to tune them, but we have a lot of ability to change up what we are actually looking at in terms of, you know, what we're targeting. So. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah. What's the size of this, of these, of these dyes, of these labels? Um, two different answers to that question. It's about the same size as an IgG. So it's 150 kilodaltons. Um, and if you lay that phyton structure out flat, it's 20 nanometers, but it actually has some natural curvature, right? So if you think about, again, about those crossover regions kind of pulling up, um, it, it's about, it's probably about 18 nanometers across. And again, that's, that's fixed. Um, so because of the, because of the, um, the stability of that structure, right? Because we want to make sure that the geometry of those frets fixed. So, so yeah, that's the size of that, of those die. Hence, by the way, the questions are in intercellular and why we're, why we're still looking at that and repeating those experiments. Wow. Those are some questions. Yeah. Great. That, question. was, that was too much fun. <laughs> so we'll, we'll hang out for maybe another 45 seconds. Um, I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and as a, as a flyer for, for, for the <laughs> quite large number of folks who are still hanging around, so I appreciate, first of all, appreciate all the time you spent with us um, as well as, and we'll get, we'll get to that question in a second. Um, as well as please note that you know we're going to be rolling out parts of different parts of the story over the next several weeks right so this is the drop-ins more analysis all the different implications of this then remember too what's the next iteration right it'd be on the tip of my tongue right be like because you can imagine sentence like and the next one and so um so so definitely you know put a pin in that uh have you noticed any reduction in antibody avidity um interesting question um trying to think if we've got any experiments that just that specifically look at avidity um have not seen it yeah go ahead Seth. only thing i can say i mean and and this is not quite getting at it but i i did for instance you know you say the cd3 in you know or other ones in the nova yellow 610 versus parts of the, the floor and the percentages um stayed similar in terms of you know what i was seeing so um i don't know that i could say that for every antibody because I haven't really tested them. And, you know, if there is a, a you know, um, we obviously we're testing to make sure that it hasn't like failed in terms of the conjugation. So that's why we are running that stuff. So. Yeah. And I think that's an important point, which is like, we know we have seen, we have seen other oligo conjugated antibodies that we can, that you can order off the shelf that just simply do not bind at all. And that's not an avidity issue or an affinity issue. It's very likely that the specificity determining region, right, has been killed by oligo conjugation right so hence hence the importance of validating right that we haven't done that but now if you think about it, you we have a platform where you could actually determine that um to your point that maybe extending your question is you know you could you could in many ways test avidity in a controlled system because you have you could also come back you know you've got that phytons system where you could say okay well how many of those do i have on our cell right um and and and, and compare that to what what's what's out there commercially so um possible yes have we done that specifically no I pre by the way, just also appreciate all of the encouragement. It's hugely helpful. Um, believe me. <laughs> um, this is uh, it's uh, it's the right type of fun, but it does it doesn't mean it's uh doesn't mean it's trivial to try and try and run this on either either side of it. So once an antibody is conjugated, can you deconjugate them? Remove the fluorescent label from the antibody. <laughs> Yeah, let's invert. Let's invert the question of earlier, which is DNA stability. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so here's the answer. We haven't specifically tested that. Do we have a? We do have a, a customer who's also a customer of our, our a large customer of our conju or customs program that's going in and testing. Can you then cleave essentially cleave the phytons off? Yeah. So, and looking at modalities of that. So again, in the absence of data, I'm not going to be like, yeah, it works perfectly, uh, but. Does it open up the opportunity to be able to do that? Yes.
All right. Well, I, I promise that we will be following up as well. Uh, again, thank you for saying thank you uh, and uh, and for attending. Really appreciate it. I, I, it's amazing to me that, that you guys gave us uh, your, your time either this morning or this evening or this afternoon as it may be. Um, again, deeply appreciate you guys uh, attending. And uh, and as we said, we will be following up with, with, uh, with different parts of the story. So uh, in the meantime, you guys have seen our email addresses, our website's vitonics.com. And uh, if you can't remember either of our names, info at phytonics.com will uh, will get you to us so thank you guys and uh, have a good evening or day or or uh, or or uh, tomorrow <laughs> see ya